Well, good morning. Now, I'm so happy to be here, and I want to, you all to open up in Romans chapter 15. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I have been thinking of another passage, since someone uh, said something about that. <laughs> well, if you could turn to Romans, no, sorry, Genesis <laughs> chapter 4. Yeah. And uh, the thing that I really like to do when, uh, because I found out that I like preachers when they tell me where they are heading, um, I will tell you my heading. This is make friends quickly. And uh, while we are going through the sermon, I would also like you to have two questions in mind. What do this tell us about God? And second question is, how should the first question influence my life? Now, we go and enter into the story of Cain and Abel. Cain was uh, a tiller of the ground. He was working with the ground. And uh, Abel was a keeper of flocks, as a shepherd type. Now, one day they decided to make a sacrifice. And Cain went over and gave his, and Abel gave his to the Lord. God took Abel's, whereas Cain's just fell down. And let us read from Genesis chapter 4, verse 5. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is scratching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. It will be like, well, just right over at the door, right behind the corner. That's where the sin is, and it is looking out to get a chance to come in and attack you. But you must master it. God informs, his, informs him about that. Now, what did Cain do? Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great. Notice Cain's response here. He do not say, No, I just realized how awful a thing I did. I killed my brother. He didn't say that. He chose to say, no, 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 this punishment is too, too great to bear for me. I can't take it. And he continues, Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. God gave Cain two possibilities for him to come and step forward. The first one was the right time where he should have acted. Second one was for him to confess what it was he had done. As God did with Adam and Eve in the garden, and gave them an opportunity 
to tell the truth. Cain did not take that. And he didn't take God's warning to heart. Now, we, we see that God then says, well, it will be seven times fold of vengeance if anyone is killing Cain. Why? Well, God do not want any more killing to be happening. And how do we know that God also do not like that men is uh, killing each other? Well, one passage that really sticks out to me is uh, uh, where God gives the Ten Commandments. And it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not tickle <laughs> or, or, I mean, murder. That's a quite clear passage, which makes us understand, well, oh, okay, yeah, it's not a good thing that I'm killing other people. Um, it will be a hard time for them to be around me if I were doing that. And it's one of the passages that I've been thinking for myself. Oh, maybe there are a few of those commandments that I've, I haven't been the best at, for example, honoring my father and mother, or God for, for that matter. But... I have not committed murder. <laughs> or what? Jesus touched on this passage. And if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 22. You have heard that the ancients were told... You shall not commit murder. Ah, that rings a bell. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say, this is Jesus who says this, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. First level. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now this is taking a, another notch up. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fury of hell. One notch high up again. So Jesus was trying to tell the Pharisees that it's not just about the physical thing where you are killing people. He has a higher standard for our lives that is up here and ours is way down here. And he's calling us up to this. But what do this have to do with making friends quickly? Good question. Keep that in mind. But is all anger then bad? Is it totally bad to be angry? Is all anger a sin? Well, if we think of that Jesus was sinless and what he was doing when he was cleansing the temple in Matthew chapter 21 and Mark 11, we can read that Jesus was angry. However, we will not go into this passage today we will go and look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, to chapter 41, no, 34, verse 7. And no worries, I will not be reading all of this. I will summarize it. I will, however, encourage you to, to read this passage at some time when you come, come home. Now, the story of this is God has freed out the Israelites from the slavery of Egypt. And he has sh shown these great things, the ten plagues, and he has made a path through the sea. And he has been leading them with this 
pillar um, of, of fire during the night and a cloud during the day. And now they have reached Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God calls Moses up to the mountain. And up there, he gives him the Ten Commandments. And one of them is that you shall not have other gods than me. But what were the Israelites doing down in the valley? They came up to Aaron and asked him. No, actually, they told him. Well, Mo Moses, we don't know where he went. He has been gone for a long time. And we want a God whom we can worship. So make us one. And Aaron's response, response was so good. He said, give me all your golden earrings and I will make you one. No, not really. But he chose to make them a golden calf, which he had crafted himself. And then they all started to worship this golden calf, giving all the glory to it, saying, thank you for bringing us out of Egypt. It would be like if we were taking this piano and during our worship time, we're saying, Thank you, piano, for having saved us. Well, the piano is as death as the golden calf, and it cannot do anything by its own. It, ha it even has to be plugged in to power to function, and someone has to play on it. The golden calf was even less of that. And then God tells Moses what was happening down in the camp. Chapter 32, verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom, brought you, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I've commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make you a great nation. Moses, Instead of saying, yes, that sounds like a good idea, went in and interceded between the Israelites and God and his anger to their sin. And reminds him of the reason why he took them out. But this is a rabbit trail which we could go at. Um, but we will not go at this here today only that God changed his mind. In verse 14, we can read that. Now Moses then came down from the mountain and he saw what was happening and heard it, took the two tablets in his hands, threw them down on the ground and they just shattered. And he went down and disciplined them severely. And the Israelites and Aaron realized how bad their sin was, and they repented from that. Now, Moses then went into the tent of meeting to talk with God in uh, chapter 33. And he went in there, and uh, God told him, well, I am not going to go and be leading you anymore. I will send an angel in front of you. But I will not be leading you in that way, as I have been doing. Because if I were to be in your midst, you would all die. Now Moses then asked God, or well, tells him, well, God, we can't go without you. We really need you. If you are not with us, we will not be able to make it.
And God then agrees to it. Okay, yes, I will go with you. And I will lead you into the promised land. And in a way, I think that Moses then, to kind of confirm this, that God has showed this favor to them, he asks, God, show me your glory. And God agree, is agreeing to that, but only that he will be able to see him from the back inside this crag in the mountain. So the next day, Moses makes two new tablets himself, whereas God had made the two ones first, and he has written on them with his own finger. Now, this is not there anymore. Moses brings these two new tablets up to Mount Sinai, and uh, he meets him up there. And what is it that God is doing? 34 verse 4. So he cut out two stone tablets, like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. This passage here shows a lot of who God is, and he says it himself. He is compassionate, and he is gracious, and he is slow to anger. Notice that anger is still in there. But he is slow to anger. It isn't uh, an outburst of anger. But he is slow. But God is also righteous. And he is just. Which is the other part of that. Which is good news. Because as we know... If evil it has, isn't been dealt with, then it will not be just. Then it will not be good. Then it will be bad. But God is slow to anger and compassionate. But what do this have to do with making friends quickly? Now we'll finally get to the point. Because Jesus here continues in Matthew chapter 5 again. Now at verse 25, he says, Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way. Do it quickly. Make friends quickly. Paul explains it in a um, puts it in similar words in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 to 28 uh, 27 be angry and yet do not sin do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity as Cain did. He gave him an opportunity to come in. And he was still angry. He did not deal with it. Jesus asked us to go and deal with the anger quickly. And further on. 
verse 30 to chapter 5, verse 1. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with the malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. When we are angry at someone, and it might even be that we are in the right of being angry of them because they have been unjust to us. God is asking us to forgive them in the same way as he has forgiven us and our sin. Our sin is so great that we will never be able to get out of it except through Jesus. And he gave his own life for us. We have broken the commandments, no doubt of that. And we will never be worthy of it. But that is the mercy and loving kindness of God that comes up and show himself there. And he's asking us to do that, to forgive others. My challenge is for all of us, also for me, to think of, do I have someone whom I hold a crutch against? It could be a family member as brother or sister, or farther away, further away, I mean, because it couldn't be a father or a mother. It could be your coworker. It could be your boss. But it could certainly not be someone in the church. <laughs> well, let us go and make friends quickly and get it dealt with and forgive them as Jesus has forgiven us. And it might be tough for us to go and do this forgiving, but then that is good that we have someone whom we can call on help. You can pray to Jesus and ask him to help you forgive these people and let go of your anger. You, are, you will not forget it, what happened, but you will not be holding this scorch against them anymore, this anger. That is forgiving. I will end in prayer. God, I pray that you may help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us and reveal the areas of which you want to deal with in our lives, God. And thank you that you are loving, kind, and slow to anger, and that you are just and righteous and holy. Amen. <laughs>